Good morning and welcome to Church of the Palms. We are so glad you found your way to us today. At Church of the Palms, our mission is to love God and love neighbor. What Jesus said were the two greatest commandments. Our prayer is that these two commands guide us in everything we do, our worship, our life together, and our service in the community near and far. The Sunday morning service you're about to join is our contemporary worship service. Lyrics to the songs will be on your screen, as well as scripture references when the message has begun. If you decide to worship in person, please dress casually. Come as you are. Bring your favorite cup of coffee or enjoy some of ours. If you'd like more information about any announcements mentioned in today's service, feel free to give our office a call or visit us online. Our website is also a great way to learn more about our mission to love God and love neighbor, and all about our small groups, classes, and community outreach efforts, some of which can be attended online. For those looking to financially support Church of the Palms, there are several ways you can support our mission. One of the easiest is online giving, which, if you are watching online, can be found in the video's description. We're so glad you chose to join us this morning. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Good morning. Welcome to Church of the Palms. I think we're going to have to start giving out tardy slips for this service. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of announcements to share this morning. The first of which is uh, just a reminder about a couple of classes that are resuming in this next week. The first of which is our grief share class. Uh, it resumes on August 5th. Um, really meaningful way to gather with people who are in similar, similar circumstances to, to share with one another. Again, that starts on August 5th. And then we have a mindfulness meditation class uh, that resumes on Friday, I guess also the 5th, uh, at 1.30 p.m. in the chapel reception room. And we're hearing that that is doing wonderful things in people's lives, drawing them closer to God. Uh, you can read more about both of those classes on page three in the, your bulletin. Next Sunday, we're having a, a blood drive here on our campus, which is our custom uh, four times a year to host Suncoast Blood Bank here. Encourage you to consider giving blood if that is something you are able to do. I know that they are experiencing a critical shortage of blood, and they will be here. Uh, also next Sunday, there will be a new members class in the chapel narthex at 10.30 a.m. So you would have to skip out of here a little early or attend another worship, but we hope you might consider doing that. It's a great opportunity to sit with Pastor Mingy to learn more about Church of the Palms, about who we are, what we believe, and to explore the possibility of membership. Um, you can read more about that on page three as well. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to Pastor Mingy. Finally, I'm delighted to introduce you all to our new tutoring director, Corinne Boot Hanford. And Corinne and her husband Dan are here this morning. Corinne has a bachelor's degree in elementary education, a master's degree in math. She taught for many years at Sarasota Middle School, was the head of the department there. And she just has such a heart for children. So we're really excited to get to uh, work with her. She's married to Dan. They have a two year old daughter named Brooke who will attend Palm preschool in the fall, so we're excited to get to meet her. Corinne and Dan, do you want to stand so we can welcome you? And you can sit down, but now I'm going to tell you to stand up again as we take a few minutes to greet one another.
open prison doors for the rain to see my life. He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Yeah.
and as a part of our life seeking to follow Jesus to find ways by which we can give to our world and to the life of the church and there are ways you can do that you can certainly give your offering on the way out the door in the basket or you can do electronically in all the ways that we have listed for you I would love to invite the mic runners to come forward they have been in training mic runners they're 
see how fast they can get to the various people that have prayer requests. Would you please introduce yourself, young lady? Hi, my name is Sydney Soboleski. I'm going into the seventh grade at Laurel Nacomas. Excellent. And your name? Olivia Mason. I'm going to be a sophomore at Florida State. Excellent. Give them a round of applause. Would you please, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Woo. Wow. Okay. And you'll see the responses for our prayers. Oh, a little hot today. Okay. No, is that me or you? Okay. Well, good. Okay, good. I uh, love for you to share with us any joys that you have or concerns. We have our responses as we listen to those concerns and joys as we lift them to the Lord. So, number one, yes. This is both a joy and a concern. My older sister, Olivia, is starting her first week as a fifth grade teacher this year, first year, so she's setting up the classroom this week, and so a joy because she's going to do great. Concern, just because kids and money and teacher. <laughs> All right, well, let's do both. We give you thanks, O oh God, and Lord, hear our prayer. All right. Others, yes. Our best friends in Michigan of 50 years, uh, their granddaughter and her husband were driving in Houston this past week. Their one-year-old son was in the back seat. They were T-boned. Uh, the parents were injured severely. The child died on the scene. And we'd just like to ask for prayers for the whole family and also for the driver of the truck that T-boned him because undoubtedly he didn't mean to kill anybody that day. And it hurts and affects so many lives, and we just pray for peace and comfort for all the people involved. What's the family name, Tom? Masters. Masters, okay. Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, through network of friends, uh, I've become informed. It's not someone that I personally know, but I've become informed of someone that recently, all, that recently medically died temporarily because they've been having weak heart problems and they're only about 20 years old. And they recently had surgery to get a valve in their heart replaced. Okay. So I'd just like prayers for them. Sure, sure. Lord. Hear our prayer. Yes, Olivia. My cousin Abby just had her baby um, last night, so she was delivered four weeks early, but they're both really healthy. And so, yeah, just prayers for her. Excellent. We give you thanks, oh God. Back. I'd like to ask for continued prayers for my um, stepdaughter, Christina, who's fighting bone cancer. She's gotten a good report. Her numbers are uh, declining, so she's doing better. But her husband's now in hospice care. His name is Bob. And also f prayers for uh, my friend, Katrine, who also has bone cancer. Here's Pam. I'm going to give you an update on Shirley Phillippe. She's in rehab right now at Brookdale, okay. and she's doing much better. We went to see her, and um, if you could say prayers for her to continue, sure. it'd be great. All right. Lord, hear our prayer. Connor. Sam Wright got his first internship. So we want to celebrate that. Excellent. Well done. Yay. All right. We give you thanks, oh God. Excellent. Okay. Let us be in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we 
are grateful that you gather us up together as the church, the community of Christ, to hear our concerns and to celebrate our joys. We are grateful, O Lord, that you hover in our midst and that you are seeking to bind up the brokenhearted and you are seeking to lift us to those places where we can be beacons of light to your world. And we pray, O Lord, that you will inhabit these prayers and that we may know of your presence and that we may be blessed with a sense of how we are to respond to those concerns around us and to the concerns of the world. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. The scripture today comes from Luke in the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, for this very night your life is being demanded of you. And these are the things that you have prepared. Whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Alex, who is one of our interns this summer and is going off to Florida. Um, go Gators. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, O oh God, to the word that just read and the words to come that they might point to the word made flesh, Jesus the Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. One of the fears that I carry with me wherever I go is that I'm going to get to the end of life and somehow miss one of the most important things. Rather than hearing from God, well done, good and faithful servant, God will say to me, you fool. Time's up, and now you've missed it. Fool is a strong word. When we think of a fool, we think of someone who spits into the wind or someone who saws off the branch that they're sitting on. A fool is also someone who doesn't pay attention to how the world works, and when others try to help them make connections, the fool refuses to listen. The old adage is, fools are often in error, but never in doubt. Given these definitions, I think few of us here today would consider ourselves a fool. By all practical accounts, the farmer doesn't look foolish either. He was a good farmer. He clearly knew his trade, and he was able to make the most out of the right amount of rain and sunshine for his crops. The farmer appears to be a hard worker, like all good farmers are, and he hasn't gained his abundance by deceit or exploitation. And yet, God calls him foolish. He's a good man, living a good life. How did he get it so wrong? It causes me to ask, how am I like that farmer? How am I getting it wrong? How about you? Chapter 12 in the Gospel of Luke begins by telling us thousands and thousands of people were pressing in to hear Jesus, who was doing some important teaching. Jesus paused to take a breath or to take a drink of water, and some guy in the crowd elbows his way up to the front, and he says, hey, Jesus, make my brother share the family inheritance with me. In today's world, he's a heckler in the audience of a stand-up routine. Jesus dismisses the man and says to us, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Every kind of greed. 
sometimes I think I might not pay enough attention to greed in my life because I put it into this category that is large and overt, kind of like John D. Rockefeller, who at one point, as one man, was reported to have 1% of our nation's wealth. When a reporter asked him how much wealth would finally be enough, he replied, just a little more. It's hard to imagine not being satisfied with that kind of wealth. So I let myself off the hook and I say, well, I'm not that greedy. I recently read the book called Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI, which describes about another kind of greed. David Grann wrote about the history of the Osage tribe, who had been driven from their lands in Kansas onto a rocky, presumably worthless reservation in northeastern Oklahoma. Decades later, they discovered this land was sitting above some of the largest oil deposits in the United States. In the early 20th century, each person on the tribal roll began receiving a quarterly check from prospectors who wanted to obtain oil from their land. The amount was initially only for a couple of dollars, but over time, as more oil was tapped, the dividends grew into the hundreds and then into the thousands. In 1923 alone, the tribe took in more than $30 million, the equivalent today of more than $400 million in one year. The Osage were considered the wealthiest people per capita in the world. Then, tragically, one by one, they were shot, poisoned, and dying under mysterious circumstances. The motivating factor? Greed. Head rights to oil and all of the wealth that it provided were stolen. Murder for money. It's easy to wag a finger at that kind of greed, right? Killing for money or grasping for more and more when you already have millions. But greed shows up in many ways. Did you ever read The Rainbow Fish? Parents, did you read it to your kids or grandparents to your grandchildren? It was published 30 years ago, the same year my oldest daughter was born, so it was a staple in our home. The story begins like this. A long way out in the deep blue sea, there lived a fish. Not just an ordinary fish, but the most beautiful fish in the entire ocean. His scales were every shade of blue and green and purple, with sparkling silver scales among them. The other fish were amazed at his beauty. They invited him to play with them, but he just glided by, proud and silent, enjoying the attention as his scales shimmered. One day, a small, rather plain blue fish swam up to the rainbow fish and asked for just one little shiny scale. After all, he was covered in them. Rainbow fish was incensed that this little fish would dare to ask him for one of his special scales. The little fish swam away, feeling hurt and ashamed, and he shared what happened with his friends. After that, Rainbow Fish was no longer invited to play with the other fish, nor did they admire him anymore. Rainbow Fish was all alone with his shimmering scales, just like the farmer was all alone with his overflowing barns. You see, greed isolates us. It's a barrier that separates us from others while focusing all of our attention on ourselves. It isn't just revealed in money or personal effects. It can also show up in the way we use our time or in our collection of stuff. Greed says, it's mine, 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 fists clenched, holding on so tightly that no one can ever have any of whatever it is that we have claimed for ourselves. It turns out, the way we make purchases and handle our money and material possessions can often be traced to our childhood experiences. In the book, The Good and Beautiful Life, that we read as a congregation a couple of years ago, the author James Bryan Smith gave us an example. Susie Orman, the popular financial expert, remembers when her father's business caught on fire. 
As a little girl, she watched her father running into the burning building, grabbing the hot metal cash register with his bare hands and running out. He fell to the ground, writhing in pain from scorched and seared hands. She was too young to process it all then, but a narrative emerged. Money is very valuable, worth endangering your life for. Therefore, you must never be careless with money. I wonder what experiences from your childhood have shaped your ideas about money and material goods. That could be some interesting brunch conversation for today. For me, my dad was born in 1937 in rural Minnesota. He was one of 17 kids. 17. Same parents, no twins, no multiple births. They lived on a farm in, in rural Minnesota and never had enough money or food to feed all of those mouths. So my brother and I were shaped with a keen appreciation for food and for any item that we possessed. The message that was ingrained in us was this, you don't waste what you have and you take good care of your things because they have to last. Occasionally, we might have a little spending money to buy something special, and that would give us a brief burst of pleasure. But I became aware of how quickly that happiness wore off. I was never under any false illusion that money or stuff could make me happy. If I had to rely on what money could provide for happiness, I was destined for misery. My narrative protected me from the greed of accumulating stuff but there's still scarcity woven into my story. If I share, will I have enough? Contrast that to the childhood experience of Ralph, who grew up on Vancouver Island in Western Canada. He lived on the Pacific Ocean, and each year there was a large salmon run. He and his brothers looked forward every year to go out on the boat and catch fish with their dad, which they needed for food for the upcoming winter. Once, when they were teenagers, they loaded their boat with fish in only a few short hours. The boys could hardly wait to get back to shore to get the fish off the boat so they could go out and get more. Ralph's father informed them that they were finished. The boys knew that there were many more fish to be caught, and when they objected, their dad said, we already have enough. We must leave some for others. They spent the next two days helping other people mend their nets so they too could have enough. The greedy farmer seemed to be blind to anyone but himself. And like the rainbow fish, he was all alone. He was isolated from God and from others. The farmer had a mindset that said, my crops, my barn, my grain, my goods, my soul. He was rich with stuff, but dirt poor in relationships. A wise friend of mine said, don't settle for less by accumulating more. The farmer missed it, and now his life was over. There's nothing like death to clarify what really matters. And since we're all here today, that means there's still time for us. The parable, along with many stories from our lives and from characters like Ebenezer Scrooge, Mr. Potter, and the Grinch, remind us over and over again that money, possessions, and our time are not to be hoarded. And just to be clear, the problem is not really posed by the size of the harvest but rather by the insistence on gathering all of it and storing it up for our own use. Any amount that is greedily gathered and kept for oneself is missing the blessing in life. It reminds me of an article I read a few years ago about a family from Iran who had moved to California in 1972. The father was a mechanical engineer who grew up with very few material possessions. His daughter remembers watching him meticulously clean and repair just about everything they owned, be it a radio, a coat, or a blender. His attention to detail was particularly extended to cars. 
No matter what vehicle they owned, it was always kept in pristine condition inside and out. In 1978, when his daughter was 13 years old, he decided to sell their Chrysler LeBaron. As a trusted advisor on all things American, it was up to his daughter to write the ad for the penny saver. His father, her father, wanted to sell the car for $1,200. Sorry, wanted to sell the car for $1,000. But his daughter shrewdly convinced her dad to list the car for $1,200 if he wanted to get a thousand. So a parade of potential buyers came to their condo, and the daughter made sure that she was always there with her perfect Valley Girl English to put people at ease, mitigating her dad's thick Persian accent. One evening, a man showed up with his two young daughters. He decided to buy the car. And said that he would be back the next day with the money. As promised, he returned the next day again with his two daughters and with twelve hundred dollars in cash. Her father took the money and thanked the man, and then he peeled off two one hundred dollar bills and handed them back to the man. He said, "This is for your beautiful daughters. Please take them to Disneyland and buy them anything that they want." The man looked confused. Almost annoyed, like he was being pranked, her father pressed the money into his hands and said, "Please, you must take your daughters to Disneyland." The girls began to squeal with delight. The man paused for a moment and then pulled her father in for a great big bear hug. As they drove away, you could see the little girls waving excitedly from the back seat. That evening, her father couldn't have been happier. He had gotten exactly what he needed, and his daughter learned a valuable lesson that she still carries with her 44 years later. When you have what you need, use the rest to bring joy into someone else's life. When you have what you need, use the rest to bring joy into someone else's life. It's that simple, but it's sometimes not easy. Because of the insidious nature of greed, we can't really go it alone like the farmer. We need to listen to God. We need accountability friends. Sometimes we need a counselor to unravel some of our childhood messages. Rainbow Fish needed the wise octopus, who advised him to give a glittering scale to each of the other fish. To which Rainbow Fish immediately responded, "I can't." He wondered to himself how he could ever be happy without all of his beautiful shining scales. And then Rainbow Fish did what we might need to do. He made one little move toward generosity. He gave away only one very, very small shimmering scale to to one little fish, hoping that he might not miss it too much. Well, a rather peculiar feeling came over Rainbow Fish as he watched that little fish joyfully swimming back and forth with his new scale glittering in the water. A feeling that he had never had before. He savored that for a moment and tucked it away. Soon, word got out, and one by one, Rainbow Fish shared his precious scales. How much is enough? I don't know. Each person must decide for himself or herself, with God's help, of course, and with an awareness of the people around us. But for Rainbow Fish, the more he gave away, the more delighted he became. Will you pray with me? We thank you, O、oh、God, for the abundance that comes from your hand. We are so grateful for the ways, Lord, that you shower us with blessings. Help us to notice them, and help us to make good, wise decisions, always with an open heart to share what we have with someone else. Thank you for your help in this process. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Please stand.
I believe we can guard against every kind of greed so that we can live an abundant life together. And now may the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow through your hearts 
so that all might see and believe. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.